Good morning, everyone. So we have a full house, which is good. There are, there are, there are no spots here in the front. So welcome to the performance in mobile session, or as the marketing called it, delivering mobile apps that perform. So hopefully, hopefully many of you have already been building mobile applications. Well, if not, it's already time for you to start doing so. So in this session, we'll try to go through what affects mobile performance and what we can do to avoid those issues. But before we start, how many of you were actually in Next Step 2013? Don't be shy. OK, we have around 2%, 5%. Not as good. OK, so two years ago, I was talking to you uh, or trying to persuade you to go mobile. And while telling you what's happening, while telling you what you should do and avoid doing when going so. So the next question is, what happened since then? Hopefully, many of you or most of you have built tons of mobile apps. And what were the major pains? I would say that the first one was actually the different form factors. So nowadays, we are, ta we are talking about iPhone 6, iPhone 6 Plus, iPhone 5. All of the smartphones, Android and non-Android. And of course, don't forget the mini tablets, the tablets, the tablets, f the phablets, all of those different form factors. Additionally, the UI of the application. How should the application be looking? Should it be looking like the native, uh, native application with all of the guidelines from Android or the guidelines from, from iOS or even the gu guidelines from Windows? They all differ. How should we build the UI of the application? And of course, don't forget that each one of the devices, each one of the operating systems renders things differently. So we also have to face that. But I would guess that the major pain was actually performance. Or should I say actually bad performance? You might have heard comments like those. The bad news here is if you didn't hear these comments, it means that you are not trying hard enough. You are not building real life applications, enterprise grade applications. So shame on you. So as soon as you leave a POC app, so when you build a POC app, it's really simple. Things go really smooth. The performance is really fast. But when you start using, when you go to production and the user start using the, the application in production in real life, then you start facing all of these issues. So the next question that you ask yourself is why? Why is the app slow? What can be improved? And this is actually what we are going to try to cover in this session. So there are several, several areas that affect mobile performance. So typically has developers which tend to focus on the code behind, so on the code that is running on the server, such as the queries, the integrations, and of, of course our business logic, and also the code, the code that is running on the device, the web app itself, so the JavaScript that we included, the CSS, and so on. But we cannot forget other areas, such as are the servers set up correctly? Or is the native shell that probably you built by hand that you didn't start from all systems now, is it well configured? And additionally, we cannot forget in mobile about the infrastructure. And actually, this is the part where I actually am going to do the disclaimer. So typically, when preparing a presentation, I'm like, oh, how can I fill in 30 minutes? But regarding this presentation was actually, oh, how can I fill this in in 30 minutes? So most of my work was actually removing slides and removing things. So some of the things might be oversimplified or might be actually missing here. And it was on purpose because I had to do, I had to pick things. So starting with the code behind, the first thing that comes to my mind is actually integrations. And these synchronous integrations are a deadly thing in terms of performance. You should avoid this at all costs. So what can you do to avoid this? Well, if you can, make uh, the integration asynchronous. So sync up the data to your site with a timer and with time, and so that when the user is using the application, it can immediately fetch 
the information is on your side and it can immediately fetch that information. If you cannot actually do a synchronous integrations, then try to use cache on those integrations that cannot be asynchronous. And in platform, as you know, it's really simple. You just need to configure the timeout or the cache in minutes. Another one, when talking about uh, out systems, is, of course, the preparation. Whenever you have long and complex preparations, that will have a penalty in the performance of the application. And I'm, I'm not talking about only mobile applications, but every uh, web application. Why is that? As you know, preparations run just before the page is actually rendered on the server. So the longer we take here, the longer we'll take to generate the page later on. So what we can do instead is actually we can break down the preparation to, what, to the, its essentials. So fetch only the really important information to, to display to the user uh, on the screen, and then start by displaying that information, and later on the, obtain a synchronous the rest of the information and it displays on the screen. So how can you do this in the platform? Simple. There is a widget on rich widgets, kind of lost there, which is list late load that enables you to call um, screen action after the load of the page. So this means that you can basically load the information after the screen is initially displayed. So the, what's going to happen is the perceived performance, and this is the next tip, which is you should design for perceived performance. Are you familiar with the term per perceived performance? Okay. <laughs> so perceived performance is how quickly a system appears to be doing its, its task, not how quickly it actually does its task. So basically we are tricking the user. A good application that actually does this, and this basically is the sum up of all of the previous uh, tips, is actually Asana, where when you click to see a task, they immediately load the information that they have available. In our case, we fetch, it the, we fetch the minimum information that we want to display in the screen, and then it starts to fetch the, the remaining information later on. So the user is immediately seeing information, is immediately seeing the screen, and they are still fetching the remaining of the information. So a recap on this, on this chapter is use the synchronous integrations whenever you can. If you can't, use cache in the application or you use cache on those integrations. Avoid long and complex preparations and design for perceived performance. Moving forward to the next area, which is server configurations. And here I might go a little bit deeper, meaning I might talk about, for example, cache control, which is an HTTP header. So it enables the server to specify that a given resource is going to be, it shouldn't be fetched from the server again for a given amount of time. So the consequence of that, imagine you have the first load where we are actually downloading one megabyte and taking two, uh, two seconds to load the page because we are doing all of those downloads. On the second load of the page, what happens is we are downloading 13 kilobytes and taking almost 500 milliseconds to load the page. So it's much faster and much smaller the request. So don't forget to check if this is enabled in your server. Another one is HTTP compression. So the server, if we have this option enabled, the server will compress the, the data before sending it to the client. As a good example, the HTML file, we downloaded 11 kilobytes, and actually the file unzipped is 47 kilobytes. So this is another thing that you should be sure to have configured on your server. Another one is actually redirect. Why should we avoid it? Well, because they are a pure waste of time. Imagine this scenario where you have an external link to another application and you just forgot to put the backslash on the end. What happened is on IIS, IIS caused a redirect immediately and it just made us lose 150 milliseconds. So it's 150 milliseconds that we are not requesting uh, any file, that we are not requesting anything and nor downloading. So avoid this. In our application, 
where does this actually shows up? Well, when we have a screen, uh, a screen action that is called, let me move to the other side, that is called by a button through an Ajax, what happens when we have a, a screen on the, has the end node? Well, this will cause a redirect. So this is something that we should avoid. Domain sharding. Not sure if you are familiar with this term or with this technique, but this technique enables us to split our static resources across multiple domains so that the browsers are actually able to fetch more files um, simultaneously. The first approach is actually this looks really good, but let me give you a little bit more of context. So this technique showed up because in 1999, when the specification of HTTP 1.1 um, recommended that browsers would only download one file simultaneously. Well, that was in 1999. Nowadays, so this was tricking the browser, and nowadays, even mobile browsers download between four to six files simultaneously. And actually, there were folks at Caldify that they did tests on mobile devices and to test if domain sharding was a good technique, and they reached the conclusion that it actually had performance penalties when, you're doing, when you do domain sharding, because you are going to um, make the browser to do more DNS lookup and so on. Ad additionally, the HTTP2 specification that is right around the corner will make domain sharding obsolete. So the rec recap, enable HTTP compression, enable cache control, be sure to avoid redirects in your application and avoid domain sharding. Moving to the next area, which is infrastructure. So we could not talk about performance in mobile without talking about latency. So latency is the time interval that goes between the request and the response. And in desktop, typically we are talking about 80 milliseconds or less, even if we are connected to a Wi-Fi. But when we go to a, to a 3G connection to a mobile device, well, this value can be around 350 milliseconds. And this is average because it can be lower, like 50 milliseconds, or can be high as seconds, like one and a half seconds of round trip. And why does that happen? Well, it, all, it has all to do with how the system works. So our device is actually trying to contact through 3G or LTE a cell tower. First of all, we have the distance. How far are we from there? How much noise and how much um, air holes are we going to get on the connection? Additionally, the cell tower has to connect to several other nodes through an IP network, which of course has limited bandwidth, until it reaches finally the internet and then come back. That is actually what causes the latency. And you might be talking, okay, LTE will solve this and in the future this will be solved. Not so much because bandwidth can always be increased, but latency cannot be decreased. Why? Because latency has to do of how the system is mounted, how this, uh, the electrical system is actually working. That's why latency is a really big problem in mobile. Another one is when you are picking your servers, your cloud servers, a rule of thumb is you should pick a region that is closer to your users. That might, might sound obvious, but it's not that obvious. Why is that that you should do? Of course, you're going to have lower, net, lower network latency, uh, quicker response time, and possibly higher bandwidth. You can actually go to this website, cloudping.info, and check which cloud server or cloud region is the best one for you. And actually from here, choose the region. I was saying that this is not very obvious because, for example, if you are in, in Manila and if your users are located in the Asia, but then you decide, okay, I'm going to put my servers in the United States because I want to grow there later on. Well, the consequence is that every request has to go around the world because there is no network cable in the Pacific between the continents. So bear in mind this when choosing your servers. Another one is CDN, which is Content Delivery Network. So this is a collection of web servers that are across the world that enable your, your content to be faster uh, sent to your, to your users. 
So as an example, we have uh, Akamai, which is a big player in this market, and they have around 95,000 of CDN servers around uh, in 72 countries. And what they will do is, depending on the, where the user is accessing, they will provide them the resources for your website or web application or mobile application from the closest server to that user, okay? And how can we use it? It's very simple. First of all, you just have to put your DNS pointing to the Akamai servers. Don't forget that you have to sign a really big contract with them because they are really expensive. And you probably noticed that the platform automatically adds a suffix to your files. That is to make possible for you to invalidate the cache whenever you publish a new version to production. So quick recap, latency can be really high in mobile. Have this in consideration and we have we are going to see later on on the slide where can this be really painful to us. Choose your cloud server according to the region where your users are going to be located and use CDNs if necessary. Now we have finally reached our device. So the previous ones are basically to all of our web applications. But now we are going to focus on what really matters to mobile. So we are going to start with the native shell. So we have talked about cache control header previously, right? And the first thing that you should know is, by default, the native web view does not have the cache control or does not have cache active. This means that even if you have specified the cache control header on the server, it will be ignored because the native web view will not be supporting it, okay? Our system now already has it active, how already has it active and implemented by default. So what you should do, what, what you, uh, I advise you is, if you are building your own native shell, you should actually go to GitHub and download the source code of OutSystems now. Another one is, if you are really building your native shell, why not bundle some of the static resources of your application? So imagine all of those big images, all of those fonts that are using your application that needs to be downloaded on the first access, just put them on the shell. Why? Because you are going to be able to get on the first access much better performance, just like if the files were already cached because the files are being served locally. We did a couple of tests with this and we reached the conclusion that if you are doing this technique and you have a lot of static resources, you are able to be three to five times faster when on a Wi-Fi connection and when on a 3G connection, you are able to be five times faster consistently because you don't have to download all of those really big files. So recap, use our systems now. You, if you, even if it's the source code, download it and use it and pre-bundle the static resources such as images and fonts. And this is really important so that, for example, you build one application that you want to put on the store. And one thing that is really typical for us to do is to put an onboarding for the user. And we want it to be really pretty with really nice images. Well, if you don't pre-bundle those images, what you are going to get is a really bad experience because the first access, you, the user is ha having to download all of those files and then the files are displayed. So put your files on the native shell. Now going to the web app itself. And th here is actually where things start to get trickier. So let's start with JavaScript. But before starting with JavaScript, let's see how browsers work. So whenever a, a browser gets it, so the browser downloads the HTML file and starts parsing it. As soon as it reaches a script tag, it will stop the interpretation of the document. And it will fetch the document and execute the document. And you might be asking, why? Why this behavior? Why It doesn't make sense. Well, the thing with JavaScript, just like Rodrigo said, is that you can do anything. And one of the things that you can do is that you can change the DOM. So the browser ha needs to have that in consideration and needs to execute immediately to see if there are going to be changes, changes in the DOM. So the question that you should ask yourself is, do you really need that jQuery plugin? Do you really need that widget on the page? 
And this is actually really important when you are thinking about building a mobile app. Because building a mobile app is different from building a responsive website that also works in mobile, also works in a smartphone. It's very, very different. The consequence of having this, of not picking the right element or using too much, is that you are going to have a lot of widgets to import. So the parsing, even the parsing of the document will take longer on a mobile device. But we are here talking about how browsers work and so on, but how actually this applies to mobile. Just another tip, also, if you really have to run uh, JavaScript, just run those scripts on after the load event, so on the page ready, when the page is already displayed to the user. So ha we have been talking about JavaScript, but how does JavaScript compares in mobile uh, with desktop? So I did run a couple of tests on webkit.org. They have a JavaScript test there. And something that we all aware and that we should have in, con in consideration and win when uh, seeing this, this, this result is that, of course, we have limited resources, CPU, memory, bandwidth, different browsers as well. We have Android uh, desktop is different from Android on, Andro on an Android and, uh, I'm sorry, Chrome is different on desktop, is different on an Android, is different on an iOS. So I executed the test several times and the average that I got on my desktop was 237 milliseconds. Okay, I was, okay, not too bad. Then I went to an iPhone 6 and it ran one and a half times slower. So it took 360 milliseconds. Not happy with the result, I grabbed the Nokia Lumia and it ran four times slower. And I was starting to get concerned. And then I decided, okay, I have my tablet here, a Samsung Tab 4, let me run the test. It will be probably even better than my desktop. No, it was 10 times worse running the test. So be aware that although JavaScript is really good for interactions and so on, when running on, when running on the device, it's slower. So let's not actually talk about why do we use JavaScript in our application. And typically it's because we want to do animations. We want to slide up, slide down, show, display, everything. So imagine that we have a simple example, and this is a really simple example, but shows how things work and how things perform. So imagine that we have a square with small, smaller squares inside, and we want to fill those squares on click of a given element, just that. So in JavaScript, we would have to do this code, so in jQuery actually. So we would do an anim animation, change the background color, and say that, okay, take one second to do this animation. And then on, with CSS3, we would basically just say, okay, this element is going to have a transition of one second, and when on active, so we are going to add one, cl one class, it will change to that. So how things do look in terms of performance? Bear in mind, CSS3 is built in the browser, built in with, C with C++. jQuery is built with JavaScript, running on an on a engine, JavaScript engine. So, CSS3 generated 40 events of paint and repaint of the element, and it took the, the second that I told it to take during the transition. In jQuery, it took nine, it actually generated 9,500 events, paint events in the browser, and it took almost three seconds to actually to do the animation. Another thing is third, party JavaScript. This is another reason why we use JavaScript in our application, because we want to have Google Analytics and Twitter and Facebook button and ads and so on. So these are really performance killers. Why? Because even if they are marked as a stink, I'm not sure if you are familiar with this tag. So this tag enables the browser to know that this script, although is immediately fetched, fetched from the, as soon as the browser reads the script tag, it will not run the script immediately. It will postpone the run of the script. However, even with the async tag, this script will be run before the load event of the page. So it will affect the load of the page. And what the solution for this is actually to load this script manually. For us to say, 
after the load, and we can even set a timeout after the load, okay, load these scripts of this API, API. So do it manually. So recapping, avoid JavaScript animations. Whenever you can use CSS3, just use CSS3. And never mind the IE8, modern devices don't use IE8, namely your smartphone. JavaScript runs slower on devices. And if you really have to run JavaScript, just run them after the load event. And beware with JavaScript because it might be your friend or your killer. Now moving to CSS. So, and let's move right there directly to complex rules. So these kind of rules you should avoid. These kind of rules are actually doing a regular expression. So the browser is doing a regular expression over all of the classes that they have, that the, the our style sheet has, to apply to that, to apply to the element the style. Another one is box shadow. Box shadow is highly computing um, for a property, and you should avoid using it in many elements. And also transform, so enables you to do really cool stuff, but be aware because it's a performance killer as well. But of course, all of these depends to the number of elements to which it is applied. So if you really have to use it, you should minimize the usage of these. Import. So probably you have seen this a lot in our themes. So whenever you are depending on, or teams are depending on, depending on each other, we are actually doing imports. And we are going to see why imports are bad in a, in a moment. But first, what happens is, what's crucial for, the browser know what's crucial for rendering, and that is the HTML and the CSS. That's why when actually downloading the files, the browser starts by downloading the HTML, then the CSS, then the JavaScript, and only finally the image. That's the order that it tries to download the files. However, when you use the import tag, what happens is the browser downloads the HTML, the browser sees the CSS files in the head, downloads them, then starts downloading the JavaScript, but when the browser starts reading the CSS files, it actually sees, oh, there are more CSS files. So it puts, on, puts them on the pile to be downloaded whenever it's possible. So it means that we are delaying that CSS and we are delaying the page to be rendering. So import delays the page, so avoid this whenever you can. And used code in CSS, like in any other technology, is a killer. And as an example, if you have 3,000 offlines of unused CSS code, and then you just change the color of, of a link, what's going to happen is you are going to get an average and performance like this. Let's not focus too much on the values, but if we remove half of those lines, what happens is we are having improve performance improvements between 20 to 40 percent. So don't forget to remove all of that CSS that you don't need in your application. Another one is images. It's really tempting just, okay, I have to display an image in my application. I'm just going to use the same image to every device. And I'm going to resize that image in with CSS. Well, this is a performance killer because we are downloading much bigger files that we, know we don't require, that we don't require to display that. So we shouldn't resizing, be resizing images in client side. So recapping this part, avoid complex CSS rules, avoid imports, remove unused CSS, and resize images server side. We are, are almost there, I'm sorry. HTTP requests, they are bad, but we do need them. So like Yahoo states, 80% of the front end time is actually spent on the, on the front end. And most of this time is actually downloading all of those components that we need. So this is by far our biggest hurdle. And you can see here an example of an, an all systems application in 3G. And what happens is we are doing 71 requests and this is a responsive application. We are downloading 17 CSS files, 25 JavaScripts, and four fonts. God knows why, or the designers know why. 72, 700 kilobytes of downloaded, and it takes eight seconds to load. This on 3G. 
And this is your typical out systems application, responsive, of course. So you might be asking yourself, how is this possible? How this, has this happened? And the answer is really simple. So the platform enables us to create modular code, so create all of those web blocks uh, that are, have everything encapsulated. And the consequence is that we ended up putting our CSS there, so it's one more file of CSS to be imported, and our JavaScript file there as well, so one more file of JavaScript to be imported. To be, in, to be imported. Hopefully, Platform Amsterdam is here to help. So they have introduced a new feature that need, you have to opt in in this feature that will actually enable to, first of all, aggregate all of the CSS of the web logs that are being used in the page, and this will enable less HTTP requests. You can see the post of Sarah Gonçalves in the All Systems community explaining everything that was done here and how it should be applied and how you can actually turn on this feature. So bear in mind, avoid CSS in pages, try to minimize CSS and JavaScript in your web logs, and beware with Teams inheritance. Now, another one that is pretty famous, probably most of you that already know the platform know this one, is the Notify widget. So whenever you have several web logs inside of web logs, and we want to notify our page about something, and imagine this example where we have six levels of web logs, what happens is that we have to notify all the way to the top. So putting it into perspective, so the, the web log six, the lower level, notifies the server stating, okay, I wanted to notify my, my, my parent. And then the parent, and then the server notifies the client, okay, this web log notifies his parent. And then this goes on, until it finally reached the page to all of those levels. And it might do an IJAX refresh. So remember that we talked about latency in mobile? So don't use notify widget in when actually building mobile applications. The good news here is that actually R&D is looking to this. Infinite scroll, just like um, Rodrigo tell you about uh, just before. Don't use it, or avoid using it. Why? And this is actually not specific to web apps. This is, even happens on, oh, if you are not familiar, but you are because of Rodrigo's talk, uh, is when you scroll down to the page, and then when you get down, it loads more results. And this is a common problem even for native applications. So what happens in our case is that each time that we, we do this, our Ajax request is going to be heavier and heavier due to the view state, as you all know. What happens also in web and also it's in native, although in native it's not a DOM, the DOM will start, start to increase and the memory usage because of that will increase a lot. So this is actually even a performance bottleneck in native applications. So whenever you have to do with a lot of information, I know it's not pretty, but prefer pagination because it will be much more performant. Silky Y framework. Probably some of you have already heard about the Silky Y framework. If not, you are going to hear later on today. What you should focus or what you should know at this moment is that if you know, or actually if you heard, if you heard uh, Gonzalo, Tokyo team actually is the team to use in mobile. This team has all of the CSS optimization and uses hardware acceleration and so on, something that I was not able to fit in in this presentation. Uh, it actually is much more lightweight in terms of JavaScript, and it has mobile-specific widget. So you should check Gonzalo's Vega talk at 11.45 today. So recapping, avoid the notify widget, avoid the infinite scroll, and use Tokyo theme. So takeaway, finally. Mobile performance is easily affected by in any of those areas. So whenever you are actually building a mobile application, you should focus or you should think that you have to do everything that you do for a web app, but much, much more and much better. Because performance is mobile is much more sensible. You won't get it right at first. You will fail, but make sure to fail quick and to 
reorganize and to do a better second version or next version. Platform Amsterdam is here to help, so do make sure to use all of these features. And thank you. <laughs>